Hey everyone, just said I'd share one of my favourite parts of the sequel to Train Spotting by Orban Welsh. I'm loath, I suppose, to quote the title of the actual title of the book for fear of um, coming across as a pervert. But uh, as you can see from the photograph there, um, it's a pretty indiscreet title porno and an even less discreet cover. Um, I was introduced to this book by my cousin John who brought a copy home after a year out in Australia. He came back to, to Ireland and he bought it in Thailand which is quite apt. Um, so thank you to John and a shout out to Shout out to him and Aoife. And he became a dad recently to Quiva. So a big shout out, shout out to her as well. Um, but I'll dedicate this vid to John as he introduced me to the book. And I doubt he thought 15 years ago when he bought it that um, his cousin would be reading it out over the internet. Um, so it's nice to it's nice to think that it stood the test of time and I'm still reading it. I suppose the one thing, the one quibble I would have had with with the with Orvine Welsh and this book, as we we're saying, the title, um, it makes it awkward when people ask what your favorite book or no. Again, you sound like a pervert. And when I got the book and started reading it first, I was at home, living at home. I suppose I was only eighteen at the time, and it led to a few interesting questions and conversations. With my mother as when i had the when i had it in my bedside locker and um, when I, at the time i was reading it but i assured her that there was you know the title was a misnomer and misleading there was nothing of that filth in the contents of the book which of course was a massive lie but there's a whole lot um more to this book than just that and interestingly my good friend tim in Edinburgh, or Leith, I should say. Sorry, that was a faux pas. It's Leith, not Edinburgh. Big, big difference. Who's who's written a book about Leith and train spotting? Just interesting when we be emailing, discussing um, train spotting, and I suppose he'd be referencing uh, some you know parts of Leith that are mentioned in in porno, and he'd always put an asterisk. When spelling it, I suppose just one of those things that emails, you know, potentially could not be sent with that in it, you know. So, yeah, I wish that Irvine had uh, had maybe gone down the Danny Boyle route and called the train spotting two as opposed to porno. But there you go. Um, it is a brilliant book. I really enjoy it, and I felt that train spotting two, the movie, made a mistake in deviating way too far from novel i felt the novel was superior to the movie if i'm honest i love train spotting too when i first saw it but having watched it a couple of times since i f feel it's pretty much a very poor relation to the actual train spotting which is usually the case with sequels but a poor relation to the novel as well to be honest about it and um, i'm not sure everyone would agree with that but i think the book is superior and tells a better story. Um, now, I suppose, to, to, for those of you who are not too familiar with it, um, the Train Spotting 2, sorry, porno starts off, we were reunited with Sick Boy, Rinton, Spud, and Begbie. 10 years later, they're all at very different stages. Sick Boy is back in Edinburgh. Or he, he, Sick Boy begins the book in London, but he ends up back in Edinburgh to run his auntie's pub. Renton has created a new life for himself in Amsterdam as a club owner, which he can't go back to Edinburgh after what happened within the train spotting. The main reason why he can't go back, Begbie, is in the nick serving a manslaughter charge and Spud is pretty static since the last time we met him in train spotting. 
he's still in the depths of heroin addiction, lurching through life, um, heart of gold, but never not progressing as such, and he's stuck. He's stuck in his ways, and I suppose Spud embodies or tells a story of a lot of people, not just in Edinburgh, not just in Edinburgh or Leith or, or anywhere, but who became addicted to heroin in the nineteen eighties, and he just could not kick it, and um, yeah, I, I suppose he plays. I suppose the, the part I'm going to read out is. It's uh, Spud plays a, a big part in this, in the subplot along with Sick Boy, and it's, uh, the part uh, I suppose in the movie itself, it's paid tribute to, in the scene where Sick Boy and Rinton go to an orange club in Glasgow. But we're going to find out the inspiration from that, and the inspiration behind behind that is a friend of Spud called Cousin Dode and the moral, is, the moral of the story is not to boast about having a bank that lets you choose your own PIN number when you have a tattoo with the same amount of digits as a PIN number tattoo in your arm celebrating a famous victory for your people um, so I read it once and I thought it was absolute genius at the time and I, I hope I hope you enjoy it um, and it might be a reminder for anyone who has their PIN number for the ATM set as something that's personal to them, that's obvious, to maybe consider changing to something a little less obvious. Um, so we'll kick off. I hope you'll enjoy. I'll stop now and again just to explain, explain certain parts, and um, I hope you'll enjoy it. So where I'm going to start reading here is when Spud has just come out of the library. He's starting um, as, as part of a rehabilitation course he's doing in group work to help him be heroin addiction. He's a project going on where he's going to write the history of Leith. And he's researching this and he's in the library and he's taking down his notes. And we begin when he's just leaving the library and he bumps into his old friend, called Cousin Dot. I pitch the books back and I head back out into the street and continues up towards Fair Edna. Then across the road, at the cash point on the corner, I see a boy who looks familiar, and it's Cousin Dod, a Glesgi filly likes. I'm straight o'er, this time watching for traffic. Dod! All right there, Spud, he says his eyes flickering in a sort of disapproval, then suddenly lightening up. Suppose you're wanting a bung. Just like that, the Ouija boy said it, man. I couldn't have believed it. Without us asking, just like that. God bless those Glasgow hun cats. Great boy, Dode. Sort of stocky wee boy with greyish hair who goes on about how great Glasgow is. But well, obviously, the boy lives through here, but man. Eh, hey, I dunno when I'll be able to square you up, Catboy. Hi, this is me you're talking to, Doe points to yourself, and we're over the road into the old salt. Just been in and changed my pin number. They let you do that in my bank, Doe explains, personal like, so that he'll remember it easier. Bet your bank doesn't let you do that, he says, all oh, superior. I'm sort of thinking about this. Eh, hey, I never really bother with banks, man. Once when they sent us on this scheme, they and the Slabian likes, they made us get an account. I goes, no, cat boy, I'm no a bank sort of gads, really, just give me cash. But they just goes to us, sorry, man, pure moderate and gig likes, Ken. Dode nods and goes to speak, but I press on, because you can't let Ouija start, man. Because as cool as those cats are, once they get into this, all right, big man, how's it going, by the way, stuff, well, those cats could sprack for Scotland. If you selected a talk team to represent the country, it's an absolute sort. At least eight or nine, say the eleven, will be Ouija's. So I goes on. Well, they let me get into the bank for a bit, but they kicked us out when the green 
Gage's stopped. These five scored an account. That's wife in rhyming slang. But she's really the lemon card bird in rhyming slang. But I call her the yeast because it's sort of like common law, man, Ken. You're some boy's bud, cousin, though it smiles, putting a hand on my shoulder. Interdum stultus bine the quitter, eh, mate. Though it's quite a bright cunt for a soap dodger likes, kins loads of Latin in that. Too true, cousin Dode. Eh, what does it mean, bud? It means that ye eh, talk a lot of sense, bud, he says. Well, that's always nice to hear. Sort of welcome words soothing to the old ego on that. So that's me well chuffed. Also, that 20 bar the good cause slipped into my mitt is appreciated and all. It may certainly is. Now this is where Spud meets Dode for the second time. Instead I turns the other way and heads up into Toon, where I runs into Cousin Dode, coming out the old salt, and we goes up to his flat in Montgomery Street for a blah. Quite a cool wee pad, tay, a bit on the titchy side, the room is like, a wee tentament rather than one of the big ones. He's got it all done up, nice and all, man, except for the big Huns picture, the Sunes era, framed on the wall above the fireplace. There's a nice leather couch, which I've pure collapse right into. I quite like Cousin Dode, even if he does sort of go on a bit. And after a couple of joints and a beer, I'm telling him about my women problems. Never mind, mate. Omnia vincit amor. Love conquers all. If he's love each other, it'll work out. If he's dinner, it's time to move on. In dav. Dod says. I'm telling him that it's not that easy. See, it's like there's a boy that used to be a good mate and him and her was were, were like an item and now he's back in tune, back on the scene like, man, Ken. The guy was a bit filly yourself, so I said a few things, tell him something I shouldn't have, Ken. That sick boy, by the way, just explain that. Veritas odium parrot, Dod says in a sort of sage way. The truth begets hatred. He adds, for my benefit. It's pure crazy me trying to do a book and I can't write my name. And there's that cousin Dole boy who is like some kind of a Latin scholar and he's a Ouija and all. They never think that Ouija's of schools, but they must, and must be better than ours. So it goes to the good cousin, how is it that you can so much about things, Dode, like say Latin and that? He explains it all to me that skins up another joint. I'm a self-educated lad of parts, Spud. You come for a different tradition, Theos Prodi's like. I'm not saying that you can't be the same as me, you can. It just takes mere work for the likes of you, because it isn't in your culture. See, Spud, we're formerly in the Noxian tradition, a Scottish palace of working class education. That's how I'm engineered to trade. They didn't quite follow, follow the cat here. But you work as a security guard, Ken. By the way, the follow, follow is a reference to the song Rangers fans sing about follow, follow, we will follow on. Dode shakes his, his head all dismissively, like that's just a wee detail. Tim pre thing, but, till I get back out to the Middle East and land another contract. You see the security stuff, it keeps me busy. I'm not trying to be offensive to you, pal. I can say this to you, that you've got potential. But you see, it's a case of the devil making work. Otia dant bitia. That's the difference between an enterprising prodigy and a feckless pape. We'll work at anything to keep war on then, to keep our discipline until the next big thing comes along. Nay way will I just sit back here spunking away all that old man money. I'm sort of wondering how much that cat's got stuffed away in that Clydesdale bank basket of his. So this is the main part now coming up and this is the actual part um, where Dode makes the mistake of taking his t-shirt off or jacket, sorry. So I suppose at this part, Sick Boy and Spud had a bit of a falling out earlier on and they're just having a point earlier on in the book but they're now having a point to make up when they run into Cousin Dode again. Sick boy exhales powerfully, but I goes in anyway. So I follow the first gadge and I see him there 
is that cousin Dode cat standing at the bar and we start to get slumber with him. Dode's getting at the Ouija and Edinburgh thing. Better fit by teams, better transport system, pubs, clubs, cheaper taxis, warmer people, all the usual Ouija stuff, man. And he's probably right now that the cat is in Edinburgh. When he goes to the bog, sick boy looks all harshly at his back and says, who the fuck is that twat? So I'm telling him all about the cousin Felly and I'm saying that I wish that Kent Doe's pin number to see if I did, I'd have dipped the cunt's pockets for his cared because he's got big dosh in that account. Aye, he keeps going on about how you can choose your union in that Clydesdale bank. When Dole came back, he gets another one in and sits doing. But then something pure rag happens. The gadge takes his jacket off and sick boy and me just look at each other. It's pure there, man, right in front of us. You could see Dode's lion tattoo with eye ready on one arm and his King Billy on the horse on the other. Aye, and just below the horse on a scroll was that pin number tattooed so that he would never forget it. 1690. And 1690, of course, is uh, the year of the Battle of the Vine, which is commemorated by um, Orange Marches and by the Orange Order and Northern Irish Protestants, Scottish Protestants, every 12th of July. So that gets sick by thinking and he co he cooks up um, a scam that he could use, he could hack into the Clydesdale bank um, if possible and see how many, his first idea was to get a list of season ticket holders at Ibrox. So to that end, he gets a friend of his in Glasgow to set him up with um, a shy single girl who works in the ticket office and a, sing and a single man. Um, he sets Nicky up with, or just to hunt down a single man who works in the Clydesdale Bank and just see the compare account numbers to see how many season ticket holders have accounts at the Clydesdale Bank in a bit to rip them off using the PIN number. So this part is when he's telling Renton about this and just getting his ideas on it. I begin my charm offensive by calling Renton up again and telling him about this scam or at least as much as I want him to know. As I talk on the phone, it's difficult coping with his silence, which at one point becomes excruciating. I want to see that face, those sly, calculating eyes, the way they can quickly morph into Ella Jones' choir by effort when he thinks he's being rumbled. So what do you reckon? He seems pretty impressed. It has possibilities, he says, but what seems guarded with enthusiasm. Too right, they'll go for it. I, we are pretty predictable, Brent considers. I mean, every other cunt in both the UK and the Republic of Ireland has hoped for decades that those six counties would just disappear while those wankers still do this pantomime imitation of the worst possible twats over there. Yes, I agree. They've no originality at all, especially the Huns. They name their mob after West Ham's, they copy Millwall's song. It's a safe bet, though, that most of them are in the Royal Bank of Scotland, but there must be a few at the Clydesdale. What exactly are you planning here? As I said, I just need a couple of offshore accounts. Come over and join me, Mark, I urge. Then I swallow hard. I need you. You owe me. Are you in? There's only slight bit of hesitancy. Oi, can you come back over sometime so as we can go over things and sort out the details like? I can get back on Friday, I tell him. Try not to sound too keen. See you then, he says. You'll fucking well see me, all right, Renton, you thieving fucking bastard. Just after I put the phone down, my green mobile goes off. The one I only... Give to guys and it's Franco. Go up myself and Moby, eh? He tells me. Fucking Barry. We're having a, a fucking car school the night Malky, McCarran, Larry and that. Nelly's back up to Manchester and all you cunt. Bummer, I'm working. I say in false disappointment. Relieved to be out of that psycho's rotary club they call Begbie's hard, car schools. Having my money extorted from me by drunken bams isn't my idea of a good night's entertainment. But it's very interesting that Begbie called just after I talked to Renton. I think it means that they were meant to be together. This reminds me as well, there's another line from a Marabou Stark, a nightmare 
from another of Irving Welch's books about the, the old form divide and when one of the characters becomes a casual with Hibs, it was like up to that point he associated football violence in Scotland as really thick Ouija's who never went to church battering the fuck out of each other to see who has the best brand of Christianity. So that just came into my head there as well. Um, which obviously is a controversial enough viewpoint, but there is a certain amount of truth in that. So the next part we're going to move on to is the actual event itself, um, where Spud and Sick Boy arrange a night out with Cousin Dode. So Spud is a bit late. Um, he meets Begby's ex, June, and helps her wash up the dishes in her apartment. Um, he's late for Sick Boy, and in his own words, the gadge is maybe one or two miles away from the amusement arcade. Cousin Doe is bending his ear and he looks at Spud and raises his watch to Spud's face. So the next chap, the next pair I want to read out is from a sick boy's perspective. Um, you can always tell the difference between the characters even with the first couple of sentences the way they speak. But um, yeah, here we go. So I'm in this grot hole pub on the walk waiting on a fucked up junkie to rescue me from this boring Ouija with prematurely greying hair, the heavy set features and eyes of, of a perpetually shocked belligerence normally only seen on the goats at Gargi Farm. Welcome back to Scotland, right enough. This cousin dode fucker, this pseudo-Saxon, North European, Philistine, lard buttocked fucking hun an entity, this troglodyte mutant from a West Coast slum, has the audacity to try and quote Latin. Latin at me, a Renaissance man of Mediterranean and Jac Jacobean stock. He gets us a drink in and raises his glass. RBARB, he says. Cheers, similia similibus coranter, I grin waspishly. Cousin Doe's pupils expand like black holes, sucking in everything around him. I don't know that gin. What's that gin? He goes, more than just impressed, actually pretty fucking excited. Well, I didn't know what his, his one was, but I'm fucked if I'd ever admit that to a soapy cunt. The hair of the dog, I wink, appropriate at the moment. Cousin Doe twists his head to the side and regards me keenly. You're an intelligent man, I can tell. It's good to meet somebody over my wavelength. He shakes his head and a pain expression molds his coupon. That's the thing, I didn't meet that many people over my wavelength. I can imagine, I say, with a deadpan nod which goes completely over his macaroon bar and spearmint chewing gum head. I mean, your mate Spud, a lovely fella, but maybe no that sharp. But see you, you've got it up top. He drums his own head with his index finger. I Spud was saying that you're into making films and that. Strange that Morphy's deemed to give me such a favourable press. Not poor, but films no less. It gets me entertaining the sentimental notion that maybe I've been a bit hard on my sticky finger chum. Well, you've got it, old. What's it they say? Hours longer, vita brevis. Art is long, time is short. One of my, my favourites, he nods, with a big grin which splits his face. Eventually, the fellow Murphy comes in, looking a bit fucking wired as well, as the Ouija rat shagger heads off to the bogs and make my intense displeasure known. Where the fuck have you been? We're no running on Tipperary time here. I've had to listen to that boring twat going on and on. But he's looking fucking well pleased with himself. Couldn't he help it, man? I ran into June likes. Had to help her wash up. It just had to be done, Ken. I, I knowingly observe, I might have fucking well guessed. That's Spud, though. Can't resist any form of temptation. Although I'd have to be desperate for I'd fucking well de rocks with June. Funny, but I wouldn't have thought it of her, especially with the bairns around. I suppose everybody's on it now, and to be fair to her, she's got those frazzled and worn out crack whore looks to a tea. So how, how is June, I ask, not knowing why. I mean, it's not as if I particularly care. Spud purses, purses his lips and blows air through them, making a vulgar farting noise, which is too loud, and might have occasioned some embarrassment had it been delivered in the hostelry of class. She's looking well rough, if the truth be told, 
man, he says, as his cousin door character emerges from the toilet and gets up another round. I'll bet she is, I nod, and we all know why. Door raises a glass of lager and clicks buds. All right, bud, we're on win the night. Then he repeats the stupid exercise with me, and I force a grin of superficial upon homie. Growing somewhat anxious for any diversion from my present company, I give the young barmaid a gentle, sunny smile of the kind that would have in my youth sent her involuntarily reaching up to her, reaching up to tidy her hair. Now all I get is a coolish twist of the mouth in reciprocation. She would trek around several bars and wind up in the town, eventually hitting the famous city cafe in Blair Street, an old haunt of mine. I know at the pool tables, a new addition since I was last in here. They'll have to go, encourages too many simpletons. On that note, I'm getting seriously fucked off at his cousin Don's character's incessant droning on, the extent that I'm actually delighted when I see Mikey Forrester come in with this obviously deranged but sexy looking whore in his slipstream. I'll be Mr. Popper in the city cafe. I really upped the quality of the client base. I've got him tow the biggest junky scruff bag Leeds ever produced, a Ouija hun, and no scabby Forrester, rubber stress as fancy goods that ever there was. I'm thinking, what am I, a fucking soap-free zone all of a sudden? The bar staff will need to get rid to kill in at closing time. It's Mikey Forrester, I indicate the door. He's a partner in a couple of saunas and runs a stable of tasty wee whores who gam for their supper. It's the age-old trick. Gets them turned on to gear and then has them working in the wholesale department to pay for it, if you catch my drift. Door turns and nods, giving Mikey casual once-over of mild disapproval laced with envy. I, a seeker, does that and all. Spud says that slack-mouthed idiot leader of the troubled adolescent still sticking to his face like shy to the neck of a bottle, even after all those fucking years. I shake my head. Seeker just rides them, but it's the only way a mess on legs like him can get his knack king, I explain. I allow myself to feel a slight bit of unease at this leg off as I reach into my pocket to feel the bottle of GHB which Seeker himself supplied to me this affy. Another man who does have his uses, albeit within a strictly prescribed arena. I pull Spud towards me to whisper into his ear, noting that it has a blob of brown wax plugging it. My nose crinkles with distaste at the rancid yeasty odour. I'm going to have a war with Mikey about some business. I crush a twenty into his hand. You keep so quite happy. Excuse me for a second, chaps. I'm just going to say hello for old time's sake, I explain to Dode, and head over in the direction of Forrester. Forrester's a sorty guy that nobody really likes, but everybody seems to end up doing business with. He flashes me a smile, and his teeth remind me of the Bingham district of the city. The whole scheme is substantially rebuilt since I last saw it. I'm surprised that Mikey's opted for a tasteful, natural effect capping rather than going for gold. He's got a sunbed tan, and his salt and pepper thinning hair has been shaved like a cue ball. The silver blue cloth on him looks quality. Only the shoes, expensive leather, but needing a polishing, and crucially, the white towel and socks, a bulk by Christmas Prezi to every nutter from their mother since the early 80s, give him away as an ex-Morphy soulmate. Hi, Simon. How's it going? I feel grateful he's chosen to call me Simon instead of sick boy, and respond accordingly. Graceful, Michael, graceful. I turn smiling to his company. Is this the lovely young lady you're telling me about? One of them, he grins, then goes, Wanda, this is sick, A. Eh? Simon Williamson. He's the boy I was talking about, just back up by London. This lad, this lass is very tidy, slim, sleek, and with dark looks, so well Latin, she should come with a cousin, Dodd phrase. She's in that first flush at junk whoredom, where they actually look really great, just before the big decline kicks in. Then she'll need to go on the pipe to get up and keep working, and her looks will go and Mikey or some other cunt would relegate her from sauna to street or cracked in. At Dame Commerce, a grand old lady who rocks in such predictable ways.